Today is August 16th, 2013. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Joe Bruckner and with me is Tony Hilliard. And we're honored to be today with Mr. H. Emery Holbrook, who is a World War II veteran and has kindly agreed to come in here and tell his story to us and also to have his story recorded for the Veterans History Project. Uh, with Mr. Holbrook today is Kathleen Creel, and Ms. Creel, we'll appreciate your input if you decide to have some. You feel free to speak up. Mr. Holbrook, we really do appreciate you coming in here, and it's an honor to be with you, and we're looking forward to hearing your story. Thank you, sir. Would you give us your full name and your date of birth? Uh, H. Homer Emery Holbrook. And I was born March 7, 1924. Okay. And where were you born? I was born at Holbrook Campground. Okay. And that's a little place that my, they say my great grandfather donated the property for this Methodist campground. That's where my, I have four sisters and one brother, plus my mother and father, are both buried at Holbrook. Uh -huh. And it's about halfway between Canton and Cumming, uh, just off of 20, Highway 20. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Well, my upbringing was, uh, we were living at Holbrook Campground at the time, and my daddy, was a livestock dealer, traded in horses and mules at the old Atlanta stockyards in Atlanta. Of course, he started out up there around the Holbrook Campground, and then he got in uh, in the business pretty well because in those days uh, he started working at the old. Atlanta Stockyards, which was Brady Avenue, a little small street that ran from Marietta Street to Northside Drive. And he had gotten big time, so instead of driving back and forth to Holbrook Campground every day, he bought a house in Sandy Springs area where he wouldn't have to drive so far. So. At that time, people, you know, were still using uh, mules to work on the farms with. And Mr. Alf, they called him, uh, he knew mules very well, so they tell me. And uh, if, if a farmer needed a mule, he'd go see Mr. Alf Holbrook to uh, deal with him. And, so, some of them said that whatever Mr. Alf told you, you could believe if the new didn't do what he promised he would, bring it back and he'd give you another one. But, uh, anyway, that, I think when we moved to Sandy Springs, I believe I was eight or nine years old from Holbrook Campground. Of course, he could come home <coughs> every night yeah. at that at that time <coughs> without having to drive so having to drive so far. Okay. And of course, when World War II came along, uh, the tractors had begun to take over from the livestock business. Mm -hmm. So he was out of out of business. But he always told us five boys. At that time, we were all still at home. There were six girls and then five boys, of course. Uh, four out of five of the first girls passed away as infants, all being born up there in the country. Yeah. And uh, the only one of the brothers that actually was born at Old Crawford Long Hospital was the youngest brother. Of course, he's gone now, too. And 
out of the five boys, I am the only one left. Wow. And also, I'm, uh, I'm the only one that actually went in combat right. of the five boys. Mm -hmm. Four out of five of them all went in the service one time or another. Okay. And I think four of us may have been, or well, three of us was in at one time. Okay. Talk was, about the circumstances under which you joined the military. Oh, uh, okay. I had uh, two good friends that we went to North Fulton High School together. That used to be the only high school in, a, in Atlanta, in the north side of Atlanta area. Uh, when we got out of grammar school at Sandy Springs, we had to ride the bus to North Fulton High School. In fact, I think they picked them up all the way from Roswell oh, wow. to, to Buckhead. That, that was a long way with the roads back it, then, wasn't it? It was. It was. And, of course, some of the guys, the little rich guys, we called them, <laughs> they had, one of them had a car. His daddy owned Hunter Coal Company, and he lived right there near me, or near us. Johnson Fair Road in Sandy Springs. Yeah. Well, this little car that this uh, this guy had, I, bet, I can't think of his first name. It was a coupe, and it, we would switch around. It had a rumble seat, I believe, or maybe a trunk, I'm not sure. But uh, Every third day, one of the three or four that would be riding to school with him would have to get up there in that little glass and scrooch way up to uh, be able to get in this little car. But we called him the rich kid because his dad owned Hunter Coal Company back in those days. And he was the only one, of course, that had a car, and we, we'd, we'd miss the bus or that was our excuse to get to ride in the yeah. car with him. Yeah. Thought we were special, you know. How old were you when you enlisted in the mil in the army? Um, I had just turned eighteen. Huh? No, beg that beg your pardon. I I hadn't turned eighteen. I was only seventeen, but I was going. This was in January the twelfth. I got my mother to sign sign the papers for me to go in. I really hadn't reached 18, but I had two buddies that their numbers came up, and they got drafted, and we three were going to stay together. Okay. And so I talked my mother into signing for me to go in about two months early in January, because I wasn't going to be 18 until March. And what year was this? Well, uh, we don't have. It doesn't I, have to be specific. I, I, I believe. Hey. I believe that would have been in 1945. Okay. Oh, I believe that's right. Just wanted to get it on record that the the yeah. war had started. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I believe okay. it was 1945. Okay. Well, talk a little bit about your first experiences in the military. Where you went, okay. where you were trained, what you were trained to do. Yeah, we we three. The three of us went from Fort McPherson to old Camp Wheeler. Uh, we went to Macon okay. to get off the train, and then from there we were bussed out to old Camp Wheeler, which is an Army base about northeast, about seven miles northeast of Macon. That's where old Camp Wheeler is, and I understand it's still there today, but I think they're renting it out for some probably for home, homes now or a yeah. rental property, I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, we took 13 weeks training at Old Camp Wheeler and then before the 13 weeks was up, two of the guys had decided that they wanted to be a paratrooper. 
and they talked me into signing up too before the 13 weeks was up, right. and I signed it. Yeah. But the time came to ship out. Those two guys went, and I only signed because they talked me into it. We knew we'd be in the States. We thought for at least six weeks training, only difference in the infantry and the paratroopers were, you had to jump out of the airplane, of course. And when the time came to ship out, 13 weeks was up. Well, they went to the paratrooper, and I didn't get to go. I had to ship out to go to, uh, uh, to go in the, in the regular yeah. military. Uh, so when you shipped out, uh, where did you go? Well, you know, uh, no, did, didn't you have some experience in Africa? Yes. Yes, when we, that's right, when we finished training, at the 13 weeks was up, we went from there to the train and went to Virginia, I think it was Kep, Pat, Patrick Henry, Virginia, I believe, okay. and we were there, just, that was a POE uh, mm -hmm. station, and then you, from there you you got on the boat in Virginia, okay. in parts unknown. Okay. Of course, uh, we wound up in North Africa. Yeah. And uh, talk about your experiences in Africa. Uh, well, we we got off, and you know, to this day, I cannot remember whether we went in Casablanca or Oran. But I know we rode the train from North Africa, I mean from Casablanca to Oran, or Oran to oh. Casablanca. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure about that. But you were in both places at, at some time? We were in those places, yes. Okay. And then uh, we joined uh, the combat force in North Africa. Okay. Uh, we went in as a replacement for ones who had gotten killed or wounded okay. in North Africa. And what I, unit were, were you in initially? Do you, uh, do you remember? I was assigned to the uh, 9th Infantry Division, okay. uh, 60th Infantry. Okay. And uh, we, like I said, we joined as a replacement for wounded okay. or okay. killed. Did you have any interesting experiences involving the trains in Africa, riding the trains? Oh, yes. We, we well, I call them cattle cars. <laughs> <laughs> Eight cows or 40 men. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we went all, all across there and they, they warned us, they said, don't leave the train. No matter what you do, stay with the train. And it stopped at every crossroads. And of course, three other guys and me, and I have no idea what their names were, we had to visit downtown somewhere in this little crossroads. And I don't remember the town, but when we, after we visited a while, we got back, guess what, a train had left us. And so, we heard another one coming, a regular old freight train, log train they called it. We got on it, and we, the next little town, we caught the, the train that we were originally <laughs> on, with the GIs on it, and You're, got with our outfits. You were pretty flexible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It wasn't hard to do uh, to catch up because they stopped at every crossroads. It looked like they'd away. Now, where did you go from there? <clears throat> from from North Africa after we got assigned to combat units, we we went in like I said as a replacement for people uh, that were wounded or killed, 
and then we finished, we mopped up, so to speak, in North Africa. Okay. And then we invaded the little island of Sicily. So you were, were you involved in combat in North Africa? Yes, some. Okay. Yeah, okay. some. And uh, then we invaded Sicily. Okay. And then after the invasion of Sicily, uh, we got on a, a boat after that was over. And of course, we, we weren't supposed to know where we were going, but about five or six days later, we wound up in jolly old England. Winch we went to Winchester, England. Okay. Uh, but I don't remember the, well, I guess it was Southampton was the port, I believe. Okay. And then we wound up in a school that was closed. We had it, the American government had it for an army barracks. So we stayed there and we could see, we could see across France over there, I think wow. it's 20, about 20, 25 miles across really? there. We could see with the binoculars, huh. see the German activity. Really? Going up and down the beach. What were your thoughts when you were looking at that? Well, we, we knew that we were eventually going to go there. And uh, of course, the night of June 5th, we got on the ship. And then the next morning at daybreak, we went from the ship to the landing barges and went in on, on D-Day, June 6, 1944. Can you describe the mood of, the, of you and your fellow soldiers when you were going across the English Channel? to France? Was there a conversation? Was everybody quiet? Oh, oh no. No, really you hadn't, uh, you hadn't experienced. I mean, you know, you weren't old enough to, mm -hmm. to think, you know, there's a bullet with your name on it, you know. Yeah. And we, we, uh, we made the landing okay. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, you were part of one of the most, more significant events in U.S. history. Tell us about that event and your experiences and what you thought, what you saw particularly. What, what did you see at, what, during the invasion and after well, the invasion? You, I, I don't know. I just know that any, anybody that says that it will tell you that they weren't scared, they got to be crazy. And of course, I was a scared little. Yeah. Blonde-headed boy, but we went in there. Uh, the next morning, about daybreak, we got off of the the landing uh, the, uh, landing craft. They flopped the gate down. The landing craft. Yeah, yeah landing craft. Yeah. We got off of there and went on, and uh, a lot of them didn't make. They didn't even make it out of the water, and uh, I didn't get a scratch. And a lot of the guys that were women the same way. We were all scared to death, of course, but uh, facing what we had to face. And we got into the beach and had our grenades on, hanging on our pack straps and when we would uh, see something we thought needed a, a grenade thrown on it, a pillbox or something, we throw them in there and uh, we made, it, made the beach okay. And in fact, uh, I didn't get a, any kind of scratch until we got about 25 miles inland. Of course, there were a lot of killed and wounded, but we made it. I say it's 25 miles in uh, before we uh, before we really hit heavy uh, heavy uh, gunfire from from the Germans. Uh, before we get to the 25 mile point, could you give us some more detail about what you saw when you got off the landing craft? I mean, did you see? 
bodies? Did you see oh, the, yeah. what had happened before you got there? I mean, what did you witness as you were going from the landing craft to the beach? Yeah, yeah, they were wounded or killed all over, all over the beach. And uh, you, you just can't imagine how, how bad it really was. But being a youngster, you, yeah. you tried to put it out of your mind. You yeah. Know? But uh, a lot of them didn't make it. And uh, of course, I was one of the real fortunate ones. Yeah. We made, made the landing, or at least I did, okay. and a few others. And uh, we, from, like I said, from there, we got, we got on in about 25 miles okay. around St. Lowe, and we hit a heavy bombardment on on and uh, enemy then, sure enough. They had us pinned down for, for quite a while. Really? And of course, I got I got hit in the leg, and I think the same the same German had his gun on me because he saw me flinch. It was a flesh wound below my knee, and I could feel. So you say the German saw you flinch? He was I, that close to I'm you? I'm sure. I'm sure he did because. When, when we got orders to move on up, uh, when I got up, when my time, Holbrook and another name called, uh, when I got up, he shot my helmet. It hit equivalent to there, and the reason I know this, I didn't have the strap hooked. Uh -huh. Thank God I didn't. But it came off of my head, and there was still a guy laying there and I couldn't tell you his name, but he he got my helmet by the strap, and when he came back, came where I was on the beach, when he got there, uh, not on the beach, because we were already yeah. in there, but when he got there with it, he, he says, hey, Holbrook, you may need this, and you might want to look at it. <laughs> well... I got it and I looked at it, and the bullet went in right up equivalent to above my ear. Okay. And when it got through the first layer by coming off my head, when it got through the first layer, it circled the inside of the helmet. Jeez. And I had an overseas cap folded up inside the helmet liner. And uh, he says, you need to really look at that. And so I did. And inside that helmet liner, I had the overseas cap folded up in there. I pulled it out, and it had circled the entire helmet liner. And that cap was nothing but a rag, and of course I threw it out on the ground. There. Wow. And uh, went, uh, I could feel my boot really getting squishy with blood, so this, Someone told me, I don't know where the first sergeant, sorry, I don't know, says, you better get back to the first aid. So I hobbled back there, and I, they were going to take care of my wound, and uh, had to wait forever, it seemed like. So all of a sudden, this guy walked up to me. Nobody wore the rank in combat. You didn't know who you were talking yeah. to, and you really didn't care. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> but some guy walked up to me, and I was standing there waiting on the first aid man to take care of my little woman on the leg. And he grabbed that, and I said, wait a minute. He says, wait, you know what? He says, you will never see that helmet again. I said, are you sure? I wouldn't follow him. On. He said, don't follow me. He says, you'll never see the helmet anymore. I said, I wanted to keep that for a souvenir if I live through this stupid war. <laughs> and he says, you've seen it the last time. <laughs> so I don't know, I still to this day, I don't know who he is. Uh, anyway, 
He threw the helmet away. And I started away. Post traumatic. They were feared that, you know, that it would bother them later on mentally. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway, that was the last of the helmet. Or says, go back and get, you get a new helmet. <laughs> So did you get your leg treated and go back into action, or what, what happened from that point? Well, no, no, we went, we went on, uh, we went back for the unit until we got pinned down by enemy fire, okay. and then uh, uh, it, it got a little quieter by us uh, shooting a lot, and uh, Throwing a lot of grenades, knocking a lot of uh, strongholds out, and then, uh, best I remember, uh, orders came out for so and so in, uh, in this 60th Infantry bunch would uh, would go go back and get on a boat to, uh, they didn't tell you where at the time, but you'd go to, back to England, uh, to England rather, and so we went, we went to England and they were trying to decide what they were going to do with us, and we stayed there to recuperate going to us, and finally, Mr. Eisenhower came out with a point system that anybody had uh, so many points that had been in different battles. If you had, a, I think it was a hundred points or more, you could get on the boat going back to the good old USA. Well, I didn't, I didn't argue about that. I, <laughs> I did what I was told to get on the yeah. boat and uh, headed back. When was this? When you headed back to the United States? Do you, oh. I mean, the, was the war was still going oh, on? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. They uh, most of the guys that took over around St. Louis from us, I believe there's a, uh, I believe there's a bunch from the Fourth Division, I believe, took over. Our position. Okay. And then most of us got out of combat right at that time. But some of them, uh, any of them that had enough points, uh, could get on the boat yeah. uh, on the way home. But uh, I happened to be one of them up here once. And I made it through that. Of course, we'd already been there. Could you say that again? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. We, the ones of us that had been already to North Africa and Sicily yeah. at that time, after then D-Day in France. Okay. Uh, Did you have a, some incident with your duffel bag before you left? With all your equipment? And oh it? yeah, oh yeah. A lot. When, when we got back to the good old USA, down at Augusta, Georgia, old Fort Gordon. I had a duffel bag full of souvenirs. I had, I know I had five different pistols. One was a French pistol, Italian, and, a, and I had a regular 45, and I had uh, a German lure. Did I say a French pistol to them? And I tell you, uh, gun two in there. And all my stuff in the barracks bag was full of souvenirs and yeah. my clothing. I thought I had it wrapped up, you know, to be safe. And when I was in the barracks, when my name was called to go get my discharge, when I came back, the bag was laying there, and the only thing that was left in that bag 
was the old OD overcoat <laughs> and the bag. And some of the guys, I said, what happened to my bag? Nobody knew anything. So I threw the bag down and the old OD overcoat. And I, I found out that you could, there was a guy that was on the, the personnel there that was with the Army at Old Fort Gordon. He ran a taxi service from Atlanta to Fort Gordon. And we had to pay him a hundred and, I think it's a hundred and twenty-five dollars a piece for five of them to come to Atlanta. <laughs> And so I was one of five. Yeah. He made he made good money, although he was getting paid by the army too. Yeah. But he he'd take time out to drive us to Atlanta and let you out at five points oh. in Atlanta. You were glad to pay the money too, weren't you? Yes, sir. <laughs> and caught the old trackless trolley then out the buckhead and called my mama at when I was at five point and dad and uh, mom met me at Buckhead at the trackless trolley. Did they know you were coming home? I had called them. Yeah, they knew I was okay. coming home because I'd already called them more than two or three times. I want to go back to your time in Europe when you were in combat, and I know you give, gave some detail, but you were obviously in some pretty heavy combat, weren't you? Yes. yes. Just, yeah, there are going to be a lot of people that see this that have never been involved in heavy combat or any combat for that matter. Would you describe just your feelings as an 18, 19 year old soldier when you're going through this day after day? Yeah. Well, you know, when you're 19 years old, you you really don't, you hadn't lived long enough to have sense enough to realize the danger. I mean, really. You don't you don't think about dying, that's for somebody else. Yeah. Like old people, 25 or 30. <laughs> 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 to us. Uh, but uh, no, that, that's, a, that's the last thing you think about, yeah. is die, getting killed at, at that age, you know. There's yeah. it, not a bullet with my name on it. Yeah. But, uh, But anyway, I made it, made it back, and I'm still here. We're, we're he glad. got a dear John letter from his sweetheart. He got a dear John letter from his sweetheart. I just heard you got a dear John letter. You want to talk oh. about that, oh. or would you rather not? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it happened to a lot of them. I wasn't yeah. the only one. Oh, yeah, I got the dear, dear John letter. Telling me she'd found somebody else. <laughs> well, I wasn't too surprised, really. Is there anything else you want to talk about concerning your time in the military? Any of your experiences or anything that you want to record for history to, to talk well, about? Well, I, I, just, I just know that, that war is hell, just like they say, you know. You've heard, but uh, when you're a kid, like I said, you you're not scared. I mean, really, you're scared, yes, inside, but you don't think about yeah. a, a bullet with your name on it. Yeah. That's for somebody else. Right. But, uh, I saw many, many kids. Laying on the beach, and uh, especially in Normandy, yeah. that, that was pretty tough. But Have you been back to Normandy since yeah. then? Yeah, three years ago, I believe it was. Uh, we went over there. Talk about your feeling when you went back seeing it for the first uh, time since you were there before? Well, <clears throat> about the only thing that, that I remember so much 
is the French. The beach is pretty much the same. The the the, uh, the pillboxes that were there that the Americans or British didn't blow up, they're still there. And the ones that were blown up, there's all the material still there, just like it was. But during the war, yeah. you would think they would have cleaned it up by now. Did you have any experiences with the French people when you went back the second time? Oh yeah. Talk about I that. I did. A, a school teacher found out that that I was a survivor of there, and uh, these little ten, eight, ten, twelve year old kids, they all gathered around me, and uh, with the teachers. Wow. And they they asked me about it. Of course, she she had to interpret it yeah. to them. But uh, they asked me about World War II. And, uh, that had to be a pr me, proud moment for you. Pardon? That had to be a proud moment for you. Yeah, it was really. And uh, I cried that day. Did you? I remember that after I told the story. And, and all the little children, they, I'm telling you, they were just so interested yeah. when the teacher would interpret it to them in, yeah. uh, in French. Uh, I tell her, of course, in, in my English, as well as I could, that I was in the... Made the, you realize what you did was worthwhile if yeah, you did before. Yeah, it was. And see those little kids thank you, and yeah. you know, she had taught him to say thank you in English. That's great. They all were proud that I did that. Talk a little bit about your life after you, after the war. Just a little bit, of, this, this is your history, so about well, what you did and your family. And... Well, after the war, uh, I got back to Sandy Springs, and uh, I, I had a job, by the way, with the old Atlantic Steel Company yeah. at that time. I only worked there two or three months before my number came, was going to come up to get drafted in the service. And uh, I worked there a few months, but uh, when I got back, I went out there. They says your job is waiting on you. Huh. seniority would go right yeah. on you know, during the war. But I decided that very day that I didn't I didn't want to work at a steel mill. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, anyway, long story short, they're at Cedartown or Cardo for somewhere now. They're not in Atlanta. But anyway, uh, I met someone that uh, says you you need to work for an airline. Why don't you Put your application in with Delta Airlines, and so I did, and uh, they hired me. And I said, "Now, I have no." I told Mr. Turner, he was the one that hired him. Jim Turner hired nearly all the employees of Delta Airlines at that time. They were kind of a small airline, yeah. and so he was the one I went to talk to. I told him I had no aircraft experience at all. And he said, well, I didn't expect you to. I says, it doesn't matter if you did. He says, we send everybody to school on Virginia Avenue, and we teach them the Delta way, mm -hmm. you know. So I went to school, I think, I think it's about, I think the yard was went about 13 weeks whether you had aircraft experience or not. And I went to work for Delta Airlines in 19, I believe it's 1946, maybe 40, 45 or so. And uh, in my career, when I had 30 years with Delta. So you spent your career with Delta? Yes. Well, congratulations. Yes, sir. They were a good company. Well, they, they really grew yeah. from from the end to now. Yeah. And the lady that he married, 
had lost her husband in World War II. You, would you like to talk about yeah. that? About yeah. Your marriage and your family. Just tell yeah. us about your family. Oh, uh, yeah. When uh, when I got out of the service, a brother two years younger than me uh, used to work at Old Rich's downtown, yeah. and he knew that that the girl that I was dating had gotten married, and he says, you know, I, I know a young lady that would be just for you. I said, oh, is that right? I said, well, give me your telephone number. Well, he did, and uh, I guess I kept her number for eight or ten months, maybe a year, I don't know. Tell him why. <laughs> Tell him why. Yeah, why? Why didn't you call her right away? <laughs> So he's ashamed. Huh? You're ashamed. <laughs> no. No. He didn't really. want to have to buy her a Christmas well, anyway. present. So he waited till after Christmas. <laughs> Smart man. I found out that you know, I need my daughter to call her. And uh at the time when I called her she was working shift work. And when I called her, she had worked the midnight shift. Plotting maps. Now this is how far, how far they've come. Now, she was plotting maps, weather maps for Eastern Airlines. Oh, okay. And uh, of course, like I said, I I had gotten a job with the, with Delta. I believe, I believe at that time. No, maybe I hadn't. No, I hadn't made up my mind. I, I didn't want to do anything. Yeah. Time, so. But I called her. And got her out of bed, out of bed because uh, she had worked that night eleven to seven, plotting the weather maps, huh. you know where Eastern was flying yeah. to. And so, but anyway, we we set a date to see her. Hesitantly, I just I, I had no no interest at all, but finally I called her, and we got a date. We had a nice time. And tell him about you met my husband before I did. Oh, yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, I met her husband at Atlantic Steel Company. Really? When we first met, I says, you know, before WW2, I says, I used to know a man that worked at Atlantic Steel Company. It was an electrician. And the first second week or so after I was out there, Atlantic Steel Company. I worked with him because I worked in a crew that that dug the ditches and yeah. all for the electrician. And she says, that was my husband. She <laughs> says we weren't even married back then. Good. Good. Said he even now Steel Small Company. world. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, and did you spend the rest of your career in Atlanta? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got to stay at Atlanta all the time. In the engine shop, and and Delta was so small then. Uh, they only worked the mechanics in the engine shop. Only worked Monday through Friday. We worked some overtime, but that was the schedule Monday through Man. Friday. They weren't even on three shifts. They weren't. They didn't work on weekends. It was less it was on overtime. Yeah. That's how small Delta was back then. Wow. But look at it now. Yeah. Grown a little bit, hasn't yeah. it? But a lot of the guys get back. They used to kid me. But uh, I used to tell them, you know, those young ones anyway, how hard that I worked. I said, we'll never go on three shells. We're going to work Monday through Friday. Well, sure enough, I had my, my 30 years was near up at the time, you know, and uh, of course I was helping train a lot of the yeah. new ones that were coming in. And so I got accused a lot of time not doing anything but showing the youngsters what to do and all this. So uh, after I retired, and left, I heard that they had gone on three shifts, 
24 hours around the clock. So I made it a point to go back out to the engine shop and tell those guys, I said, see, you guys, y'all used to tell me that I didn't do anything. And after I retired, I said, you had to go on three shifts, seven days. <laughs> <laughs> Just to make up for your retirement, you being gone, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. We had a lot of fun. Of course, we, we uh, no, nobody worked too hard, really. Things have changed. It's got to change, you know. Well, you've had an interesting life, and you're still having an interesting life. And I, well, one thing I want to do before we stop is to see if anybody else has any question or anything to add or any suggestion. And no, if, I'm just proud that um, my children all respect my friends so much and that they all three of my children were here to, to honor him well, and I was proud of that. I sure understand that. And I was sorry that his son could come because a business. Yeah. He had just one son, and he had a wonderful daughter that was killed in an automobile accident uh -huh. when she was like in her early twenties or yeah. early thirties. It was. Yeah, she. Uh, yeah. And uh, of course, she was you'll thirty never years old. Get over. Yeah. And, uh, losing her. She got killed in an automobile accident, and the son married a girl that was in training at Old yeah. Georgia Baptist yeah. Hospital from Florida, and uh, he was introduced to, to uh, her huh. being a nurse from yeah. Florida. Of course, they got married and moved to Florida, yeah. and then our daughter got killed. Of course, the wife died in 2002. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I know that had to be very tough. I know you're. Yeah, it, it was, but the last five years was tough. Yeah. Because she had, I guess it was the beginning of all time. Oh, gosh. And she asked me every day the same questions Are you going to put me in a nursing home? I said, No. Uh, Not as long as I'm able to keep uh, you home. So, five years of it, it was tough. But. I'm glad I was able to do it because I know she would be well, the same. You were obviously a wonderful husband so, you, right. and father. So. Right. right. Well, it, it, it's really been an honor to be able to meet you and to, to hear your story. And before well, we stop, I just want to give you a chance to say anything else you want to say on well, the record. I, I appreciate it. And uh, I know you guys hear a lot. And uh, I appreciate like people like you in carrying on history, uh, and I was glad to tell my story. Well, we appreciate somebody like you who fought for our country and uh, lived a, a wonderful life. Yes, I have, really. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Appreciate it very much.